guys for coming out tonight uh, for our monthly installment, Counterinsurgency Then and Now. This month we're focusing on women and repression. And basically what we do in these events is to present concrete cases of repression and then analyze and discuss what should be, could be learned um, from the events that we're discussing and presenting on, and also how to guard against these types of forms of repression, surveillance, etc., how to guard against them in the future. Um, so this month, we're talking about Rosa Luxemburg, Anna Maya Quash, Judy Barry, and Asada Shakur, who are all women who are at the forefront of various revolutionary struggles over the last hundred years. And they were all subject to execution, snitch jacketing, surveillance, bombing, harassment. They were also jailed and exiled. So to start things off, we're going to start with Rosa Luxemburg. And Gerald is going to present on her. She was a Polish-born revolutionary and involved in a lot of struggles, mostly in the country of Germany, and was executed by the state. So Gerald. Thank you very much. Okay, there she is. Red Rosa. One of her quotes, freedom is always the freedom of dissent. I have to tell you, she wrote this in a document, in a polemic against Lenin and uh, the Bolshevik uh, party. Because I think the situation in Germany at the time she wrote, you know, around 19. Around in there, she was an avid supporter of the 1905 revolution in Russia, and that event changed her mind because she thought and I'm positive, that Germany would be the first country on the earth where you had a successful workers' revolution of socialism. But once she saw that 1905 revolution in Russia with the Soviets spontaneously erupting, she actually changed her mind. That's an important feature. You're not dogmatists. You learn by interpreting new events. So, who is Rosa Luxemburg? Red Rose. Rosa Luxemburg was among the greatest revolutionaries of the 20th century, bar none. She was a top notch intellectual, wrote many books, but not just, you know, people write books, there's books in these books. Her books, stand alone today. I invite you to check out some of her literature. A fervent women's liberationist, a world-class orator, an anti-war warrior, an elected official. She was elected to the, they call it the Reinstein in Germany. Here we call it the Congress. And she was elected by the German working people to represent them in the parliament. She was a socialist theoretician. She wrote some heavy, heavy tracts. Very useful and still relevant, in my opinion. She is also a Marxist economist and became, unfortunately, a martyr for the international working class. First, a little bit. Excuse me. Can we see? Can you all see? Turn off. First, to understand Rosa Luxemburg, it's important to understand the organization in which she rose, in which she developed, and became the leader that she was. I'm going to call them the Socialist Party of Germany. Actually, it's SPD is the Socialist Party of Deutschland. All right, and at the time, this, uh, this was a, a socialist party that only, that was one of the only that had a relationship with Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, the authors of the Communist Manifesto. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so what they did was, they developed a theory that they wanted to make, after being part of the first international, going through that experience. When they disbanded the First International, they felt that what needed to occur was the workers needed to build mass parties in every country. They wanted to build, see mass parties built. The Germans were especially good at it. They built, from 
the ground up the trade unions in Germany. They built something called cooperatives, where people need food and housing cooperatives, so that workers could get reasonable, you know, buy food for reasonable amounts of money and buy a place to live with a reasonable amount of money. They formed something called workers' schools. Now, this is a time, we're talking 1870, 1880, a lot of workers had never, there had not been public education inside of Germany yet. So a lot of workers could not read. So they taught them to read capital. <laughs> well, that's, just, that's what they used. They serialized it and they put it in. They had over a hundred different daily newspapers, social democratic daily newspapers. These guys were growing. They were also, I think, very great people, because at the time, the chance of the country's guy named Bismarck, Oliver was born Bismarck, and he hated him. And he hated him, well, obviously. There was a war between Germany and France around 1817. The Germans defeated the French army, and following that war, as you know, revolution, you know, war is the mother of revolution. So, when the, the French lost their army, the workers in Paris took over Paris and formed something they call the Paris Commune. Inside of Germany, see, this wasn't like it is today. You know, people can only talk shit and say things, you know, they, they, they don't understand. At that time, to go inside, <laughs> you're in Germany, and to say that you're poor, the French, cost you. So, for instance, Babel went to jail. August Babel went to prison for declaring that he was for the defeat of his own government in that war. And his organization, the Socialist Party, was driven underground. They were declared illegal, they were banned, they were not allowed to meet publicly for any other purpose than they let them, for some reason, they let them run for office. But they would not allow them to have a meeting like this one. Right? They would not allow them to have a meeting. They were illegal. It was an illegal organization, forced underground, for 10 years. They formed a group called the Young Pioneers. A lot of people here in the United States think that the United States invented the Boy Scouts. Actually, the Boy Scouts was modeled on the Young Pioneers that the Germans had started in the early 1900s. Also, <coughs> excuse me, they had a parliamentary fraction, they called it, with hundreds of thousands of voters behind them. They kept getting sent back to Parliament. And they had, I think, a very important tradition that they started. And that is, when it came time to vote for the budget for the nation, they would vote against the budget. How do you vote against the budget? Well, the budget included military expenditures. And they were really against war. If you're really against war, you don't vote for the budget. In fact, out of that slogan, not one man not one penny for the period of war. That was the German Social Democracy. They were the largest, strongest, and most political section of what was to become the Second International. Now, there was a major controversy that broke out around 1898. Um, I should mention that Rosa Luxemburg was born a Jewish family in Poland. And around age 16, a very bright person, left the Southern Roman University you know, and then eventually wound up in Germany. Well, this controversy in Germany was important. It was very important because what, what it was about was a, a gentleman by the name of Edward Bernstein. Ooh, 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 ooh. I tell you what. Oh, let's hold up on that. I'll go back to that. They, they had, I told you about the party of the whole class. We'll get back to the business controversy in one second. Okay, let's go to Second International. Okay, here is a photo of that gallery, of one of the galleries. The Second International was composed of, or the Socialist International, was composed of groups all over Europe, mass workers' parties. So, let's see. It followed the first international, as I said, that was founded by Marx and Engels. It was organized in 18, 18, 18, 1889. 
And I guess one, one would have to say the German Social Democrats were the leading light of this international. It was rather loose. They had people in the international who thought they were Marxists. They had people who were syndicalists. They had people who were Fabian socialists that believed in the gradual development of socialism. And actually, it was a problem because of the early success of these parties, the theory began to be accepted that, you know what, we just keep running for office, and eventually when we get the majority, well, it's too social. Not true. Bad, bad, bad theory. You will never, ever vote socialism in. In order to have socialism, you can't have capitalism at the same time. So you have to smash the state. And ain't nobody that ain't about to vote. That takes a different type of action. So that was, a, unfortunately, a very common illusion that many of the socialist parties held at that time. OK. The Socialist International was seen as an instrument of social revolution. And they did the best they could at the time to build up their influence. One of the problems they had, though, was Around 1890, around the time they got started, imperialism and colonialism was existing. So you were socialists, right? I'll, I'll talk about this weakness a little later. But there was something called social Darwinism. I know, I hope maybe you've heard of Darwin, Charles Darwin, right? That's the theory of biological evolution. Some people wrongly took his theory of you know, biological evolution and tried to turn it into a social theory, meaning that, look, us Europeans, we're going to show these Africans how to live. See, we're going to show these people in Latin America how we, how we do it. So we're going to exploit them mercilessly in the name of capitalism. And I guess one day they'll just figure out that this is the best way. It's ridiculous. It's, a, it's very, very backward theory. It's not scientific. But it did, it was located inside of the second international and substantially weakened the international, which leads to this whole question of bureaucratization. I would, I would like to quote Rosa Luxemburg on this process. She said, without general elections, without freedom of the press, without freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, without the free battle of opinions, Life in every public institution withers away, becomes a caricature of itself, and bureaucracy rises as the only deciding factor. And that's, that's Rosa Luxemburg. Now, it, it, okay. bureaucratization and degeneration of the Socialist Party of Germany. Okay, what do you do when an organization goes bad? Well, of course, in Brooklyn we say, what's it to you? <laughs> well, for the workers, it means something. You give your whole life, you struggle, bust upside the head and everything out, to try to build this organization and start sliding off the rails. What you want to do is try to save that organization. The first really dangerous situation came about when this gentleman here, Edward Burns, the one mentioned earlier, uh, a leader of the Socialist Party. And homeboy was old school. He wasn't no poop butt. He was a serious militant. He had, when they were outlawed on the ground, he went into exile in England and he was the editor of All Works, which was the theoretical journal. So he wasn't someone to be taken lightly, but he was a human being. And as, you know, when you build an organization, and this is what a lot of, I know about my friends, a lot of other people, have a problem with this, and this is the problem of organization. What do you do? You have an organization, well, you gotta get the mail. Somebody gets the mail, okay. You gotta answer the phone, well, you know, you gotta answer your correspondence. You gotta take care of business. At a certain point, if somebody says, well, you know what, and you may have to do it, this, let this be your job, we'll pay you. Okay, that's cool. Well, now you have a worker who is no longer really a worker, he's a part of the workers' organization, but he has been lifted out of the labor process. There's a relative privilege here, believe me. Most of us would not work if we didn't have to. Right? We don't work if we love capital. We work if we have to survive. 
When this situation repeats itself over and over, you want the building a bureaucracy. Now, a bureaucracy in and of itself is not bad. You need editors. You need office managers. You need people to do the work of the organization. But when this happens over a long period of time, you have potential trouble. People get comfortable. And there's no such thing as a comfortable revolutionary. When you have a comfortable revolutionary, you got problems. So what's happening here now, the German Social Democratic Party, with all its greatness, is beginning to become conservative and bureaucratized. In part, an organization is not one guy. On the left wing, we got Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Murray, and all of the kind of outstanding stand up militants. In the middle, we got people like Carl Koss, who was the Pope, so called, world socialist. And on the right wing, we got people like Mr. Bernstein, who is moving to the right. He wrote a book, and you can still get this book. It's called Evolutionary Socialism. And in this book, he posits the following. He, he covers a lot. But mainly, what he says is, look, you know what? One, we ain't got to worry about smashing those state. We can win the election. I mentioned that earlier. And two, you know what? It really doesn't. We're doing so good here. We're slowly winning the majority. If we just keep doing what we're doing, we're going to have the majority of people with us, and we'll just, you know, we'll win. So he said. He rejected dialectical materialism as a worldview. Historical material, thought it made no sense, thought it wasn't a necessary component of the proletarian world outcome. Well, people that were genuine Marxists could not accept this, so they fought back. And here, this sister, <coughs> Rosa Luxemburg, for the first time really stood up, and she wrote a book called Reform or Revolution. I recommend this pamphlet to every one of you. It is still relevant. And the reason it's so good is she, point by point, answers Mr. Bernstein and explains why he is wrong. See? And does it so well. She was only 28 years old when she wrote this thing. It was clear the talent that this woman had and the leadership role that she was destined to play. I'll just mention one of our arguments because we have the same thing today. She pointed out, she said, look, you're talking about the trade unions and making life better for the workers. Yeah. They do. It's good. But capitalism goes into crisis from time to time. Recession, depression. You say in those situations, what you have then is a situation where the wages actually go down for a minute. So then we fight back and we try to get the wages back. And what she compared this existence of the trade unions to was the labor of sissocrats. Did I say it right? Sisyphus. 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 All right. Sisyphus. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Greek person that was given the, they put the curse on his ass, and every time he tried to push the boulder to the top of the mountain, it get past him to go down. The, well, no, wait a minute. Uh-uh. That ain't what we trying to do. I ain't feeling that. We want to win. We actually want to bring an end to this suffering. There's no much capitalism, all right? So she explained, and I'm telling you really well, and a little, little fancy big word, but for the most part, if you really get into it, you will learn something and why not only revolution is possible, but inevitable. And why we don't want to get caught up in any plans to think that it's just going to come easy, as Mr. Bernstein had suggested. Okay. So, just really quickly then, what, all right, we understand social dynamics. And I think it's safe to say that whenever a revolutionary organization fails to achieve its goal after a number of years, it tends to degenerate. Black Panthers. Black Panthers started in 1966. Most people will admit that the Black Panthers' revolutionary period was between 1966 and 1969. Then you get the COINTELPRO, we were disoriented. Then, if you recall, 1971. You calls all the Panthers to come to Oakland, we're going to quote, take over Oakland. What happened? Bobby well, still ran from there. There you go. There you go. All right? I mean, I'm sorry. That's just the truth. 
know, and study it. Check it yourself. So it's not just, you find this with any organization that's running. It's going to tend to the It doesn't mean we should, the first sign of a problem, we should abandon our organization. We may want to fight to keep it on track. And that's what Rosa Luxemburg did so well with her famous book, Reform or Revolution. So what is revisionism? Well, there's two types, of course. When there's a new world reality, the world changes. Sometimes you have to look at the situation and say, okay, okay, we, we have to, now we have a different situation. We need to look at our doctrine and revise it. That's conceivably a good thing. But unprincipled revisionism is what I'm trying to, to distinguish here, and I believe that's what Mr. Bernstein was engaged in. It reflects the ideological pressure of the capitalists inside the workers' movement. You see, our people go bad sometimes. And we have to not give up. We have to struggle with them and try to keep the ship afloat. Okay. So, here we go. Here is really what one would think would have been the end of social democracy. When uh, old habits got hard. August 4th, 1914. World War One begins. There's a, a vote in the Reichstag, that is the German Congress, over whether or not to give war credits. You know, so, well, what had the German market, social market been doing every year until, until this year? No. They had voted no. No, no. So everybody was sure, okay, well, we know if German social democracy came to fire. Well, unfortunately, they voted for the war credits. And people were so shocked by it, many people didn't believe it could be true, that this party that had been the leading light of the Socialist International turned around and supported their own capitalist class in a war. And this war, what a war. We talk in 50 million casualties. 50 million casualties. Worker against worker. Slaughtering each other and for what? But as you know, war is the mother of revolution. So Rosa Luxemburg immediately, she said, oh no, not be honest about it. She made a mistake and she voted <coughs> for the war credits because their fraction worked as a group. And she was very much a team player. I like team players. But sometimes right is right. And she mistakenly voted for the war credits with the rest of the fraction. Carl Liebnick, her partner, went home and thought about it. And he came back and changed his damn vote. And for changing his vote, he was drafted into the army. <laughs> he then put on his uniform, went out, and made an anti-war speech. They locked him up. Next day. I mean, that, see, that's the way it goes. And by the way, don't let nobody tell you about the democracy in America. Oh, that's, that's dirty. They don't do that in America. Yeah? Did you ever hear of Eugene B. Debs? Yeah, he was locked up also for being, speaking, acting against war. So that's, you know, there's no exception for America on that. Um, she was locked up June 16th. She was giving speeches anywhere she could against this war, why, why they should not support the war. I'm talking about as soon as it happened, like 1914. But they got tired of hearing and locked her up. June 16th, kept her in jail about two years. All right. When they got out of jail, they immediately started to say, what are we going to do now? The Socialist Party rocked. We can't do nothing with it. So they formed something called the Spartacus Bund, in German, English, the Spartacus League. 1916. That's Carl Liebman right there. And unfortunately, they were a rather small organization. You know? And the war is in progress. So they did what they could. They agitated. You know, they did everything they could. But in the meantime, in October of 1917, something else happened. And it wasn't in Germany. That is, the Russian Revolution. And when they saw that Russian Revolution, basically, pulled over Rosen and said, hey, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we want to do. 
here. And they started, of course, making that clear in their speeches, etc. Well, who in the past is not happy about this? But they didn't go to jail right there. Not right at that moment. It is when they, they joined the independent social democrats for a minute because the social democracy split three ways. The left wing was the smallest, the independent social democrats, Karl Kosky, and then on the right, Ebert, Scheidemann, Nosky, these were the leaders of the right wing of the Socialist Party. In 1918, you have a mutiny in the Navy. That is, the sailor said, that's it, we threw at you. We threw at you, this don't make no sense. Shot the officers, we set up their own committees. This is very serious. When, when soldiers shoot officers, this is pretty serious. <laughs> something's wrong, okay? So they, they, they have this mutiny, and the workers then start striking. So Carl Liebnick, you know, he's ready to go. He said, look, that's it. Let's do it now. Let's make a revolution right now. Rosa Luxemburg did not believe that they were ready. But they went on, and the next year, 1919, they formed the Communist Party. The KPD, Communist Party of Deutschland was formed. And no sooner than they found it, I think it was January 1919, they found it. They found it. The ruling class, uh, see, remember, 1918, I'm sorry, I didn't mention this. In 1918, they said, they got to have somebody, they kicked the Kaiser out. They said, you know, it's, it's all his fault, right? It's all his fault. They kicked the Kaiser out. But who's going to run the government? They actually had the right-wing socialists take over the government and run the government for the capitalists. And they did. We gusto. In fact, the leftists have always called them the bloodhounds of capitalism. Because as soon as Rosa Luxemburg and them emerged as the Communist Party, they said, that's it. We, we can't just stand there and watch it. So they sent a group called the Fry Corps. The Fry Corps were right-wing soldiers that had returned and kind of formed a little group, a precursor of the Nazis. They sent the Fry, the, the Fry Corps and they, were, they basically kidnapped, well, no arrests. They basically kidnapped Luxembourg and the evening. They captured them on the 15th of January, and they killed them. All right. Now, I do think there is something that we can learn from this, and that is, let's look at the Russian Revolution. Very quickly, I just want to point out, in July of 1917, the workers were feeling it. They thought they could take power. Uh, many of the leaders of the Bolsheviks did not think that this was going to occur. But they understood their obligation to stand by the workers. So they participated in this demonstration, which was crushed by the provisional government. But get this, Lenin had the good sense to know how dirty his opponents might be. And he left town. Shit, you're supposed to leave town. Shit, you hide. God damn it, this is look at him. Don't let him just come and get you. It's called a strategic retreat. Yes. Well, strategic retreat is good to do sometimes. Because remember, July wasn't but one month. He was right back on it in September. They, unfortunately, these comrades did not make that decision. They made themselves available, and unfortunately, they were killed. Now, I would like to share with you her last words. And you can see them, I'll read Luxembourg's last known words written on the evening of her murder were about her belief in the masses and what she saw as the inevitability of revolution. She said, the leadership has failed, talking about the Socialist Party leadership. The leadership can and must be recreated from the masses and out of the masses. The masses are the decisive element. They are the rock on which the final victory of the revolution will be built. The masses were on the heights. They have developed their, this so-called defeat into one of the historical defeats which are the pride and strength of international socialism. And that is why the future victory will bloom for this, when she puts in quotes, defeat. Order reigns in Berlin. You stupid henchmen, your order is built on sand. Tomorrow, the revolution will already raise itself with a rattle and announce with fanfare. 
to your terror. I was, I am, I shall be. And while she became a martyr, I must say this. She wasn't, you know, even in death, she was right. Because in Germany, there were revolutionary attempts in 1921, 1923. I mean, just, they kept trying. And it's so tragic because a person, a revolutionary of such high quality, I can say might have certainly had some effect on the results of those failed revolutions. You know, a great revolutionary, Rosa Luxemburg. Okay, thank you. Children, uh, teaching children native culture. 
um, and trying to better the conditions on the reservation, establishing social services, uh, education, um, doing gardening, like teaching people how to eat better food that the government issued food that was crap pretty much. So uh, let's go back uh, to uh, identifying her. So once uh, her name came out, uh, the wounded knee defense of this committee uh, requested that there be another autopsy and the real, uh, her real uh, cause of, my, uh, of, of her death uh, to, to find it out. Uh, so they do a second autopsy, but once FBI found out that the wounded knee defense of this committee wanted to do so, they issued their order to do another autopsy. So, like, they figured out that it's too late, you know, they can't say no to that, so they issued an order to dig her up and do another autopsy. They said that they're going to hire a pathologist and, you know, but wounded uh, need a passive committee asked if they could have a pathologist that would observe the, uh, the autopsy. Uh, so the day uh, of the second autopsy comes, uh, Dr. Peterson shows up, who, uh, who is hired by Wounded Knee Defensive Test Committee, and FBI's pathologist that's supposed to be there never shows up. Uh, so Dr. Peterson is not prepared, he was supposed to be just standing aside watching. Uh, he doesn't have any tools, he, he has nothing. Uh, but since the FBI pathologist doesn't show up, uh, he sends somebody to a local store to get a butcher knife uh, and decides to perform the autopsy. Uh, he goes into the room, and I mean, you don't need a doctor to determine it. It's pretty obvious she has a wound going from the back of her neck and the bullet sitting right above her eye. Uh, so it's pretty obvious that she got shot. Mm. The, uh, so that's what's put in another autopsy. Her family is outside. And her family is asking the FBI agents who are also present above um, of, of the autopsies uh, to get her jeweler back. And they say that no, this is evidence, we can't give it back. Uh, they insist though, and then one of the FBI agents takes a box uh, that has her hands in it and throws it at the family. Wow. So the family gives the box with her hands, uh, gives it to the doctor and asks the doctor to uh, put it, to put the body back together uh, so she can be actually properly buried. Uh, so, uh, could you again? Uh, so again, I mean, uh, the first autopsy, you know, there were doctors present. The nurse even says that she saw the blood gushing out of her neck. The doctor said that there was a bullet sitting there, but that's not what they put in it. Uh, so obviously there is some camera, and what are they trying to cover up? Uh, and the cover up is really messy. Like, how the hell do you overlook a bullet hole? You don't. Uh, how do you not recognize a person? The FBI agent who was one of the agents present at the first autopsy was an agent that uh, repeatedly interrogated her, uh, questioned her, mm, then there was a couple of other agents involved. Also, it's Pine Ridge Reservation. She was a pretty well-known figure. Uh, she did a lot for the community. You know, everybody knows everybody on Pine Ridge, so uh, people would definitely identify her. Uh, the thing was when FBI kept her body, they wouldn't even let people see it were not authorized, of course, by FBI. Uh, and then, how is it easier to cut off somebody's hands than just, you know, send the fingerprints to Washington? Uh, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, it was a really messy cover-up. Uh, and a little bit more about the hands. The so FBI was uh, acting in a long history of colonial tradition of chopping off uh, parts of the bodies uh, and genitals, genitals of the natives. Like during colonialism, they would keep uh, both 
genitals and parts of the body of natives in, in the salons as trophies. Uh, so that was, I guess, the, the model be, behind uh, cutting off her hands. Uh, so then, you know, they uh, they didn't cover up. Uh, the cover up was really messy. Uh, it's obvious that she's murdered, but then FBI claims that there is no traces that they can find out who murdered her, what happened. Uh, and people uh, who killed her are not getting prosecuted until 2004 and 2010. And to remind you that whole thing happens in 1975. So that's quite a big chunk of the time. Meanwhile though, people uh, know who, who was an actual killer. Uh, and um, even a story in the newspaper come out, uh, came out by uh, investigators uh, armatures uh, who point by point like said like what happened and how it happened. Uh, so uh, pretty much Anna May disappeared in December '95. She was kidnapped. Uh, she was held. Uh, she was kidnapped by members of AIM. Uh, she was held in different apartments under guard. Uh, in December '75, uh, she was taken from Denver to Rapid City uh, by three people. One of them was Telda Clark, uh, who was mostly doing the driving, but she was also the person who uh, allegedly put a snake jacket on her. Uh, then Arnold Looking Cloud, uh, who was a drunk, who was just taken, it seems like he was just taken along to the situation and he claims that he didn't know, uh, who, that she was about to be shot, uh, and John Graham. Uh, who was allegedly the person uh, who shot her, but mm, uh, he never admitted to that. Uh, so for years, hundreds of people knew who killed her and how. Arnold Looking Cloud even admitted to, mm, uh, to John Trudell and to other people, uh, confessed that he was present at the crime scene. Uh, and again, the story was already published. Finally, in 2004, uh, Looking Cloud was found guilty, uh, and there's a videotape that he admits that uh, Graham shot her, shot her and he was at the crime scene. Uh, so he gets live, uh, then um, uh, John Graham is in Canada, so they try to extradite him. Finally they extradited him, but he didn't uh, get sentenced until 2010, three years ago. And then Telda Clark um, had escaped the indictment on the grounds that she had Alzheimer's. And by the time the whole trial started happening, uh, she was an older woman. She was about 50 something when the whole murder uh, was uh, happening. Uh, so maybe play the other video. And they said that she was an FBI informant. 
Did you ever think she was an infirm? No. Was she ever questioned about that? Being an infirm? By she wasn't questioned by me. How about Leonard? Did he have? Well, no, I don't. No, I'm not. I don't believe he did. I don't believe that. We both solidly trusted Annie They didn't trust her. They need that at home. They didn't trust her. Kamok Banks, who has never spoken publicly about the inner workings of AIM, has a particular reason for remembering that incident. I knew that she had been questioned, which was in the same time I had learned about her relationship. I learned about her relationship maybe the day before with Dennis, and I was very upset with her. Then the next day I had heard that she had been interrogated. The guy was put up next to her head by women, and that comes from four different sources, and the next source, of course, was anime, and anime was the one that said, uh, if you believe that I'm an informer, then you might as well go ahead and pull the trigger. Those weren't exact words, but close enough to it. Somebody that she had considered a close friend has gotten drunk and held a gun to her head. And that he said, um, anime, everybody's saying that you're, that you're giving us up and that everywhere you go, somebody's arrested. She told me, um, if you believe that about me, then I give you permission to pull the trigger. I actually didn't find out the, some of the details of that interrogation until I talked to Iris Thundercloud a couple years ago. I said, when we were comparing notes and finding out that we were <clears throat> both interrogated about the same time from the same people. And uh, it was Iris that told me that they put it on her mouth. She convinced them that she's okay. What do you think? But was she an informant? No. No. I know her too well, and I trust my judgment. And at that time, you were doing her. You know, she got out of jail, and they just let her go. And, and I remember Annie telling me that they were setting us up. So when the kids were playing, then we had a chance to talk. And at that point, she had told me that they, uh, the uh, American Indian movement had uh, were, you know, talking amongst themselves, whoever these people were, and they uh, thought that she was an informer. I said, well, why are you going back? She said, I have to go back, and I have to just let them know that they're wrong. The American movement at that time was well what happened to Anna May, that two of the leaders ordered her death. Brennan Balfour made the phone call to the house on Rosebud, which is my brother's house. And Brennan climbed out where two feet to call to Brennan. Then he should be ordered for her death or murder. She was brought here uh, by members of the American Indian Movement, and, and she was executed right on top of this hill. She was shot in the back of the head, fell over the bank, and then laid where she was found, and, and basically left to die. And um, I feel that it was uh, the result of uh, paranoia amongst people within the American Indian movement, that she was an informant. There's no question in my mind. And the other question, be alive today, if they did not believe that she was an FBI informant. Was she? She was not an FBI informant. Definitely was not. She never just another good Indian to us. She's her mother.
much. Uh, let me start. Uh, Effie, I was pretty much sitting on her ass uh, for the whole time. Uh, she had filed a small FBA file until she started raising money. And she went to LA a couple of times and was getting like pretty big donations from like some of the famous actors. Uh, she went to LA always on a fictitious name, but FBA was pretty much following her everywhere. <coughs> Uh, they also, she got arrested a couple times on, uh, with uh, gun possession, so uh, she, she did get arrested, and of course every time she got arrested, uh, FBI questioned her, and as uh, with every single I member, uh, they tried to have her snitch. Uh, she refused to snitch a couple of times, uh, but during one of these sessions, Agent Price, who was present at the first autopsy and did not recognize her, uh, told her that she either starts talking uh, or she will be dead within one year. And as we know, she was. Uh, so she was um, a victim of snitch uh, jacketing, which to, to remind you, uh, snitch jacketing was when somebody points a finger at somebody and says, oh, they're, they're cooperating with FBI. Uh, they're, they're snitching on the movement. Also, when, um, when two agents are standing by each reservation, 
Um, and FDI is trying to blame Frank Peltier for that. Uh, they're missing one thing. They're missing a person who will give a testimony that they saw Peltier or heard Harry Peltier, um, you know, me talking about it, uh, or saw them do it. Uh, they don't have anybody. Uh, Anna May, of course, has not been uh, there during the accident. She was somewhere else. Uh, but, you know, she was within the movement. And they wanted to make her uh, admit that she helped Peltier do so. She never did. Since Peltier didn't do it. Um, but uh, FBI is really pissed off at her because, you know, she, she won't talk against uh, anybody and she won't snitch for them. Uh, also, how they uh, made another woman uh, testify against Peltier, falsely testify against Peltier, is when Anna May Akwash was still, when they found her body, when she was still supposedly not identified, Agent Price, again the same agent who was at the first autopsy and who questioned her multiple times, uh, showed uh, Myrtle Porber, uh, another Indian woman, uh, showed her pictures of that Akwash. Uh, so he shows her the pictures and tells her if you if you don't give us testimony that Peltier killed these two FBI agents, that's what's gonna happen to you. And that's when she gives a false testimony that she saw Peltier do it. Uh, so you know, let's come back to the scene Jack I think. Um, you know, it's everybody, people in the movement, it was really intense time, you know, you find out that there is informants left and right, so, uh, you know, it's, nobody can really tell the difference between a person who's been snake jacketed and an actual informant, except for FBI. Uh, since a lot of times in other cases with black hunters, FBI would leave a note fabricate a note and leave it somewhere where other black hunters could find it, indicating that this or this person is a snitch, uh, just setting up the situation so the other members kill this person. Uh, so here, they didn't fabricate an actual physical evidence, but there was, you know, something. There was phone calls uh, and accusations that obviously were orchestrated by FBI. Uh, so also, uh, in November 76, government announced that, um, uh, let's go back to the Peltier case. Uh, so the Peltiers, uh, you know, they're trying to frame Peltier, and they have this motor home that's donated by Marlon Brando, so Peltier, animates a Aquash, and a bunch of different people, uh, are in the motor home. Uh, they uh, all get arrested. Later on, the government announces that and there were two informers on the bus, uh, on the motor home. Uh, they never identify them by name, they just say an informer A and an informer B. Uh, can betray the caravanners, and they obviously becomes obsessed in finding them. Anime squash is on the caravan. Uh, so, another head security for, for AIM, who replaced Dr. Durham, who was found out to be informant, uh, coordinated the count. And somebody called another native woman, Thelma Rios, and ordered that Anna may be brought to Rapid City from Denver, and then, then she got killed. Um, so, pretty much, um, FBI set AIM members up. Uh, so later on, a lot of FBI cases were released, and uh, a lot of these FOIA documents are really hard to read since you know, FBI blocks out all the important information and just leaves a sentence or two if even. Uh, but in these FBI files, we see that there it's a common thing that FBI was doing for the American Indian movement and <coughs> other movements. Uh, but especially with AIM, there, there was a lot of cover-up of cases of natives that were beaten to death by uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs policemen. And most of these autopsies said that there was a death, it was a death of exposure, like they did in an animated case. 
And even the cases that led to prosecution ended in minimal or um, jail time or suspended probation. Uh, so it was pretty much a common practice. And uh, the final trial in 2004 and then 2010, uh, a lot of these F uh, FBI uh, agents were uh, made to testify. Uh, all of them said that they hardly knew about Clinton Pro, or if they knew, they knew that it existed, but they had nothing to do with it. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, you know, in the 70s, Clinton Pro was what consumed the whole body of FBI. And then, you know, for years, you know, everybody uh, knew who killed her. It's just we still don't know exactly who gave the orders, but obviously they came uh, from FBI. Uh, so again, the truth of CoIntelPro is that the whole truth we, uh, will probably never be known. Uh, but what we do know is that a coach was murdered because government, government waged an officially sanctioned convert war on the country's foremost movement for Indian rights. Uh, so this is pretty much it on the presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. discussion of the American Indian Movement next month. Um, we will be showing the incident at, at Oglala and plan to have a native elder from Maine here to discuss the case of Leonard Cotier. Uh, that's next month is the 29th of April here at 7 o'clock. And next we have Karen Pickett, who's a good friend of Dean Berry, who's here to discuss at the FBI repression against you.
So it's just going to pretty sure it's about five minutes and it's got a good introduction to Judy herself. Yes, 
time and most of the environmental movement to this day um, doesn't really have a good class analysis. And Judy did. Her background was in labor organizing. And she just she had not only worked in labor organizing and led strikes, but um, you know, she had studied the history of the labor movement. And so she came in with her class analysis and started talking about it and about you know the difference between the loggers and the CEOs of the timber companies and you know it kind of seems like a no-brainer except that that discussion hadn't really happened at that point. And she was um, she was able to communicate with the timber workers. It, it was a very politically hot situation in Northern California and yet she was able to do outreach because of her background in labor organizing and talk to the loggers and talk to the mill workers. In fact, she went to bat for um, the mill workers at the Georgia Pacific Mill on the coast when there was a PCB spill. And um, the bosses were saying, don't worry about it, it's just water. It wasn't, it was, it was toxic. And nobody did anything about it. And she came in and talked to the workers and filed the Cal OSHA claim. Which they ended up winning. So she was building these bridges, and in fact, just before the bombing, um, or for several months before the bombing, uh, very few, few people knew about this organizing, but she was doing very much um, under the radar organizing, meeting with workers, and getting them to join in uh, Earth First. IWW Local Number no. One. These were non-unionized workers, and she was getting them to, to join this IWW union. And she had some takers, and it was building, but it had to be under wraps because it was dangerous for the loggers and the mill workers to be talking to the environmentalists because it was the the line of the heads of the timber corporation that you know any job loss was because of the environmentalists <coughs> and because of regulation and not because of their overcutting, which was, in fact, the truth. So Judy was building these bridges, and it hadn't been done before. These conversations hadn't happened before. And that's why she was dangerous. She was dangerous to the timber corporations and to the powers that be. And you know, the, the timber corporations had, had put a lot of work into driving this wedge between the, the environmentalists and the workers. And it was, it was working, it was a great deal of hostility. And it was Judy's work that was, that was breaking that wedge apart. And so she was, she was seen as a threat. And she was also one of our best organizers. Um, Ribbon Summer was largely her brainchild. And she was a brilliant strategist, so I think you know, for all these reasons, she became a target of the corporations and of the government. And as far as the, the FBI's involvement and COINTELPRO, um, you know, it, it was a horrific event. And when it happened, we never dreamed that something like that would happen. And, you know, there had been protesters beaten up, there had been a lot of physical violence, um, always perpetrated, you know, upon the, the tree huggers and other protesters, but, um, and, and a lot of death threats and um, that, that came in many ways. I mean, I got threats, a lot of people got threats, but Judy and Daryl got the, the largest amount, they were, they were the visible ones that were out there organizing on the road, and Judy got more than anyone. You saw the image of the, the picture that was taken from a newspaper of, of her face with a rifle scope superimposed across her face, and that was posted on the door of the Mendocino Environmental Center of Indiana that she worked out of. And even though we had no idea, we still don't know who the bomber is. Um, but right after it happened, we knew nothing. But we did know that right away things were smelling very fishy. And, you know, the first thing was that when they came on the scene, as Judy said, the FBI was there immediately. Now, this was in Oakland. Um, it was on 
Park Boulevard by where the McCarthy Freeway goes across, um, right by the high school there. And so the FBI, how the FBI got from San Francisco over there so quickly is, is you know, something that was never explained, but they were there like immediately. Mm -hmm. And of course the, the Oakland cops are on the scene right away, but they they started taking orders from the FBI and the FBI mm -hmm. kind of you know took control of the situation and and told the Oakland police what to put in the reports and and how things were and that's how the, the story of the location of the bomb got changed because the first cops on the scene, you know, there's a car, there's this giant hole about this big underneath the driver's seat. And that's where the bomb exploded. And so they wrote that down. And by, um, by the end of their short time at the actual scene, before they took the car away, the bomb had moved locations, and it was part of the arrest warrant. So they had these three big lies um, that were the basis of the arrest warrant for Judy and Daryl. One was the location of the bomb. The FBI said it was in the back seat, therefore they must have seen it, therefore it was theirs, they were carrying explosives. That was a lie. The second big lie was, we know these people, they're affiliated with a terrorist organization that carries out violence. That was our first. That was a lie. Redwood Summer was a campaign of uh, summer love of, of nonviolent civil disobedience. And the third big lie, which actually came a little later, not at the scene, but it was the matching nail. And the bomb was wrapped in finishing nails for shrapnel effect. And there was a bag of nails in the car because Judy worked as a carpenter, besides an organizer. And the bag of nails in the car was roofing nails. Now, finishing nails are long, skinny nails. They don't have a head on them. And roofing nails are short, fat nails with a big, round head. They're nothing alike. You can't mistake one for the other. So that was the third big lie. And the duct tape. Yeah, duct tape. Well, they found duct tape everywhere. Duh. Duct tape. You know, everybody has duct tape. Um, so, you know, they, they identified these things that they found in Daryl's van, in Judy's car, at their houses, at the Seat to Peace house that they turned upside down um, that were bomb making materials. And things like, um, you know, felt pens and duct tape. So, um, even at, at that same time, I actually happened to be the, the first person who got to the hospital. I got a call um, where I was in Berkeley at the Ecology Center, and I just sped out the door and went to Highland Hospital, and Judy was in emergency surgery, and the FBI and the Oakland police were there, and they took me downstairs to question me, which I thought was kind of... Normal, this is what cops do, right? A bomb just exploded. They're supposed to ask questions, um, maybe of people who know these people, about what could have happened. And so the only thing that I told them was, I said, okay, you know, you guys are from down here, and they're from up on the north coast, and you might not know it, but there's a lot going on up there. And people have been getting death threats, particularly Judy and Daryl, and they've been um, increasing in severity and frequency, you know, up and up and up and up until today. This kind of seems like a culmination. Um, it's, it's a culmination that we didn't think would ever happen. But um, so that's you know that's where you need to look in that direction. You need to look there really fast, and um, they didn't seem interested at all. <laughs> that information, and they just started asking me personal questions about myself, and so I, I yelled at them, and then they took me down the open police station and held me for several hours. But um, and so while I was there, I called KPFA and I called the lawyer because it's like, you know, something is horribly wrong because a bomb exploded in in our friend's car, but something else is 
was really wrong to with the direction that this is taking. Um, but also, we were looking at it critically because um, not only you know did they quickly turn around and, and try and blame the victims, but this was not Earth First first brush with the FBI. A year before, in 1989, uh, the FBI busted people in Arizona who were carrying out monkey wrenching actions, um, mostly things like um, they took down power, um, power poles that were bringing electricity into a uranium mine under construction on, on sacred native land. And they, they did bust them. It was also um, all a setup in order to get the person that they thought was the head of Earth First who wasn't involved in these monkey wrenching actions. Um, because this is the way, you know, the FBI can't think outside the box and they can only look at organizations or any kind of infrastructure in terms of, you know, a hierarchical structure. And so they figured if they took out the head, then the organization would completely fall apart. Um, well, they did arrest him, and um, the organization didn't completely fall apart. But what we found out when they were arrested in 89 was, if it, was that Earth First had been under surveillance for a number of years, that they had spent um, more than $2 million, and it was an FBI agent who had been undercover for two years down in Arizona making friends with everybody, and they had, they had other agents undercover and informants. So when that happened, we started, you know, this is a year before the bombing, but we started reading our history about the FBI's um, repression of political dissidents and came to understand the stories about what happened with the Black Panthers, the American Indian Movement, the Puerto Rican Independences. Mm -hmm. And so we knew this, you know, we all had agents of regression on our on our bookshelf. So when this stuff started happening after the bombing, it was recognizable. And what happened um, before and after the bombing was also reminiscent of what was going on in some of these other campaigns, like they were phony press releases. Um, and all of these um, flyers and other documents that that said Earth First and um, were made to look like they were coming from Earth First, calling for violence in the woods, you know, in, in order to just heat things up. And they were distributed in, in the mills up in Northern California, um, in laundromats, and, and all of these logging towns, timber towns, where um, the mill workers and the loggers lived. And also in, um, in Arizona, um, it, there was also an attempt to associate Earth First with explosives. Um, because the, the action that they that they had busted them at, they were they toppled um, transmission towers, bringing the power to the Central Arizona project, and they were using cutting torch. And the FBI agent who was in on the action um, bought the cutting torch, trained them how to use it, drove them to the action. Um, or was it the FBI agent? It was the FBI informant that they had hired, um, who had been in their employ for quite some time, tried um, over a long period of time to get them to use thermite. Thermite. Which is, it doesn't, it doesn't like cause an explosion, but it, it gets hot enough to, um, to heat through metal. And, but people see it as an explosive substance. So, um, in that way, you know, if they had been arrested with their rights, you know, then they would be the first bombers instead of the first monkey branches. But they didn't do it. So that operation was called Operation Thermicon, but it wasn't 
It wasn't an FBI operation to, to break up a thermite conspiracy. It was an FBI operation to create a thermite conspiracy. The biggest thermite conspiracy is how it really fell on that man. So the, the, the false documents and the disinformation campaign that was carried out um, before the bombing, but, but with, um, with much gusto after the bombing, is something that's reminiscent of the foreign cultural operations that we carried out against these other groups, like the Black Panthers and AIM. And also the, you know, the firing up of these groups, you know, with the Black Panthers, it, it was, uh, you know, feeding information to and firing up racist groups. And with the environmentalists, it was feeding information and firing up um, groups in what was called the Wives' Use Movement, who suddenly had this really large presence in Northern California. Um, and they did trainings for these timber groups. Um, they, they had a workshop that was a dirty tricks workshop. And so they were, they were inflaming our enemies, which is really common with the FBI. You know, they get, they, they will carry out their own lethal force, but oftentimes they'll get other groups to do the dirty work.
are still out there and what the story was. But she was um, organizing from her hospital bed and did really effective organizing um, for the summer, even though she couldn't be there. So what we, our, our response, um, you know, initially it was to, to stand up to this violence. And as, as she has said many times, it was, you know, stand up to their, their violence or their nonviolence. And to still carry out the campaign that we knew we needed to carry out. And, um, oh, and I should mention too that they, they were arrested, um, but the charges were were not filed. You know, they were kind of in this limbo. They were going to be charged with, with um, carrying explosives. And they said that they were, because um, Judy and Darrell were on their way to Santa Cruz to do an organizing gig for Redwood Summer. Um, they played music together and they were both very effective speakers. So they were you know, going down there to, to recruit people. And what the, what the FBI said is that they were bringing a bomb down there um, to, to get sympathy on themselves or to bomb a target. They, they were kind of confused about exactly what the, <laughs> what the target was. They were either going to bomb the, the transmission power tower down there or you know, they would have the bomb explode in, in order to get sympathy. But you know, even, even if you were somebody who had who believed that, that, that this was a viable tactic to use explosives in some situations and were going to carry out that plan. If you were going to use a bomb somewhere and you were driving to that somewhere, would you make it a bomb that was an anti-personnel bomb wrapped in nails that was set to go off with a timer and a motion device so that when your car changed lanes it would explode and when you hide it underneath your seat. You know, the, the whole premise was absurd, but um, nonetheless, that whole thing along, you know, we had these headlines in the paper every single day um, about matching nails and, you know, they kept coming up with new evidence. And so they, and, and the media complied very nicely um, with all of their propaganda. And after um, a number of weeks, um, I don't know exactly how many weeks, they, um, they basically announced that they were declining to pursue the charges. And I have always been convinced that, um, that the turning point, when they realized that they couldn't pursue the charges, um, was when a coalition came forward that was not organized by us. We kind of had our hands full with security for Judy and Red the Summer and weren't <laughs> organizing other things. But it was um, people, a lot of people out of Earth Island Institute, and it was mainstream people. And they got together and they had a press conference. And it was people like um, representatives from the National Organization for Women, um, Congressman Ron Dellums. And they called for a congressional investigation of the way that the FBI was handling this. And they put out this call very publicly. And basically, you know, they came and they, and they took possession of the car because it was evident. Um, so it wasn't until we got those photos that, that we could say, you know, look at this frigging hole underneath the driver's seat. There's no mistaking that. And here they were standing there at the scene pointing to the car and saying the bomb is in the back seat. So that's, that was the first time, you know, that we were able to say they lied and they knew they were lying. It was deliberate. So Judy was, um, Judy really put the case together. I mean, we have an amazing legal team that's been working on it, um, that worked on it all those years, and is still our legal team. Um, Dennis Cunningham, Ben Rosenfeld, Bill Sinvich, 
Tony Serra, uh, and others. And you know, even though they're they're a great legal team, it was Judy. She's the only one that read every single word of uh, those five thousand pages of FBI documents. So she not only read them, she did these synopses and analogies um, so that. Once we didn't have her anymore, we could still carry on the lawsuit. And she literally worked on the lawsuit up until the day she died in 1997. So she wasn't ever going to give up. And so when we tragically lost her, um, we had to carry on with the lawsuit. We had to do that. And, you know, and as Judy always says, this isn't about me. This isn't about Daryl. This isn't about her first. This is about all of the activists that deserve to hang on to their constitutional rights, even though they're doing radical political organizing. And that really was what the, what the lawsuit was about. And it took, it took 11 years to get to court, 12 years after the bombing. Um, but we got into court in 2002. And it was a six-week trial, jury trial, very exciting. Um, and we won. Yeah. And it, it was it was amazing because the, you know and, and there were many many funny moments in the trial. But you know you get to you throw the covers off the FBI. And I sat through the Arizona trial too. And one thing that I, I really took part from was they had all these FBI agents on the stand down in Arizona is that most of those people are really a bunch of, you know, they're yahoos and they're kind of dumb shits. I mean, they know how to do their job, but they're just, they can't think outside the box. And so if you have an alternative structure within your organization, or if, if you have, you know, politically creative thought, they just don't get it. They can only think of things in their terms. I and mean, there's a few exceptions in, in the FBI ranks to that, and I found that kind of heartening. And in the Judy versus FBI trial, um, I just love you know, saying the name of that court case. <laughs> um, the FBI agents, we were suing both the Oakland police and the FBI, and the FBI agents um, were particularly arrogant because they thought that their lives would keep working, you know? And so they're, they're just bringing out the same old arguments. And they were lies. And because we had a jury, um, and a pretty good judge, who, who didn't cave into all their objections, then um, the jury saw it. They saw that they were lying. And they saw that the First Amendment rights had been violated grossly. And so the decision was really strong. It was strongest on, on, um, on free speech rights. And it was really, you know, it really was a victory for us all. And amazingly, it's to bring it to present, it's uh, the case <laughs> is still going on. I mean, we won, and we had a settlement after that so that um, they, the FBI and the Oakland police agreed not to appeal because you can get you know, stuck in appeal for years and years and years. <coughs> and um, we didn't. But they had, as, as part of the agreement, after the win, um, they said that they would, uh, before, the, I mean, they closed the case long ago, but they had the physical evidence. They would um, notify us before they destroyed any physical evidence. And um, amazingly, they did. I'm, I'm still amazed that they didn't just, you know, someday, one day it was gone and they'd say, oops. <laughs> but um, they notified us and we had to fight in the court for a couple of years to get it. But it was um, just very recently transferred from the FBI's hands. I mean, it's, it's fragments of the bomb. Um, from the FBI's hands to um, an independent forensics lab to want to do the testing that the FBI never did because they never conducted an investigation. They conducted an anti-investigation that 
consisted of, um, of investigating, compiling lists, tapping phones, doing all this um, information gathering about all the environmental activists in Northern California. And they never followed up on the death threats. They never looked at um, you know, where the hostility was coming from. And so it's the testing that they didn't do, but plus today there's there's technology, DNA testing, that kind of technology that wasn't um, that wasn't available in 1990. So um, we'll see what what this testing shows. And you know, the one other thing that I'll say is that just like. You know, Judy was, was never going to give up. My favorite Judy Berry band that we, that we bring out every Judy Berry day. That was another thing. Oakland police declared May 24th Judy Berry day, even though we sued them. And yet, they declared May 24th. That was the, the day of the bombing, Judy Berry day. So every year we do something. Um, and last year we had a great event at Oscar Grant Plaza. But, um, you know, the banner, the studio with a fist in the air in front of the FBI office and saying, don't ever give up. And we never gave up on the lawsuit, and we'll never give up on, on finding the bomb um, until we do. And at that time, you know, it could come to pass that, that Judy's quit in, from her hospital bed in 1990 might uh, come to be true, what, what she said when she was being interviewed by a reporter um, who asked her, well, what do you want the FBI to do? And she said, I want the FBI to find the bomber and fire him.
throughout the history of her being on trial and incarcerated were against, um, worked against her publicly. She was accused by the FBI of being a leader of the movement, a murderer, and kidnapper of a drug dealer, as well as possessing weapons. She was never convicted of any of these crimes until uh, the 1973 incident where she was obtained during the New Jersey Turnpike shootout. Um, in uh, May 2nd of 1973, Asada Sundiata Akole and Zaid Malik were driving down the New Jersey Turnpike when they were stopped by a New Jersey State Trooper um, for alleged uh, traffic, for an alleged minor traffic violation, which Cointel Pro um, stated that activists should be stopped for these minor traffic um, violations. Uh, the, the trooper James Harper, who stated that Asada Shakur removed a pistol from her handbook and shot him, uh, later testified in the grand jury that uh, she never, <laughs> she never um, saw that she was ever seen with a weapon and that he had lied. Um, also, during this incident, uh, her partner in the BLA was murdered, Zaid, Zaid was murdered, um, however, Singhiat escaped from the car and a state trooper, Warner Forster, was killed. Both Singhiat and Asada were charged with um, accomplice to murder and assault with the attempt to kill of the state trooper, of course. Later, she was convicted by an all-white jury um, because they said she was present during the scene of the crime. Even though three neurologists testified that with a broken clavicle, she would have been shot with her hands raised above her head. And also the fact that she had a uh, severed tendon in her arm, it would have been impossible to, for her to pull the trigger on any weapon. There was also no gun residue found on her fingertips after the incident
in New Jersey hospital, she was tortured and um, she was interrogated. There were also a number of Nazi members in the police department in within New Jersey. And there was a specific incident where one of them came into her room and um, basically stated that he fought for World War II on the wrong side. And this is a brief quote of what he said. He said that if Hitler had won, the world would be the best that it is in today. That niggers like me, no good niggers, wouldn't be going around shooting New Jersey state troopers. He went on to say that the white race had invented everything because they were smart and worked hard. That other races wanted to riot and use terrorism to take everything the white race had worked so hard to get. Um, and
the Clinton Correctional Institute for Women, where uh, she escaped from prison when two members of the Black Liberation Army came and rescued her. Um, miraculously, they were not searched for weapons when they went through the visiting visitors checkpoints. They were able to grab her and made a getaway when, where there were two cars waiting in the parking lot. Immediately afterwards, the FBI was on top of it, searching for her, interrogating her relatives and other party members. Um, however, she escaped to Cuba in 1984 and was granted political asylum. Bravo.